सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर वी विल स्टार्ट क्लास विद इन टू थ्री मिनट सर ओके ओके यस सर ओके मेरी एम दी मंदे उपल सर वो सर सर टू थ्री मिनट सर सर प्रेजेशन लोड रेडी सर रेडी सर 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 चपड़ सर हेलो सर 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 सॉरी सर चपड़ सर हाँ ओके सर श्योर सर नो नो इश्यू नो इश्यू सर नो इश्यू सर डन सर good morning students uh, some power issue at uh, mohan ganda sir's uh, place uh, please wait for 5 minutes uh, sir will join again within 5 minutes okay
Sayyid, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, shall we start? Yes, sir. Okay, Sayyid, are you patented? Presentation. Hello. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Now, today we'll talk about disaster management. Now, uh, disasters, as you know, uh, are of two types. Natural disasters like floods, earthquakes, droughts, landslides, cyclones, etc. And man-made disasters like riots, wars, um, or motorcycle accidents, or uh, boat accidents, air crashes and things like that, or terrorist incidents and uh, bomb blasts, etc. Okay, now I'll tell you a small uh, little diversion. When I joined the National Disaster Management Authority, we first wanted to know how to describe a disaster because it's known by various names in various parts of the world. It's called an emergency. It's called a, um, you know, a catastrophe. It is called a disaster. Uh, so what should we call it? Then some one conversation between the leader of the opposition in parliament in Britain and the prime minister at that time. The prime minister was Disraeli and the leader was Edmund Burke was recalled. I believe uh, the question was parliament was discussing what is the difference between a calamity and a catastrophe. Ante upadravaniki pramadaniki enti tadani. So uh, apparently the leader of the opposition got up and told Disraeli. That, sir, if you drown, it will be a calamity. But if somebody saves you, it will be a catastrophe. Until you are going to die, you are going to die. Because you are going to die, you are going to die, and you are going to die. That was just a joke. Then, slide three, Saida. Slide three, Saida. Okay. Then, slide three, Saida. This is my own formula. You will not find it in any textbook. You see, how to define the vulnerability of, say, Vijayawada city. Now, what you say is, what are the first you see what are the disasters to which the city is exposed risk at risk so as you know floods can happen in vijayawada and then uh, very rarely um, you know earthquakes can have happened very mild ones and also cyclones very often come during the season november october and all that so that is the risks to which the city is exposed and uh, prone then Exposure. Exposure means what is likely to be damaged in case a disaster happens. Like, for instance, the built environment, buildings and people. Now, risk into exposure is the total vulnerability. That is the amount of damage that can take place in case one of the disasters all or more than one occurs. Then, the more you prepare, the less the damage will be, no, naturally. So, you divide it by preparedness. So, the, the more the preparedness, the less the value of this vulnerability will be. And as risk and exposure increases, it increases. Right. So our idea should be to decrease uh, exposure, decrease, increase preparedness because risk cannot be changed. It is natural. Next. Four. Now, global situation, you can see how many lives are lost in thousands uh, every year and how much economic damage also takes place uh, in on account of disasters. So this uh, this is in billions of dollars. As you can see, something like, uh, you know, in uh, 2014, it went up to worldwide, this thing went up to something like $30 billion, which is a huge amount, okay? Not by 30, it's actually, yeah, $380 million. Then also number of uh, the tens of thousands of uh, deaths, occur each year on account of disasters. Next one, six. Now, this is an interesting map. Slide six, please. Ah. Ah, this is an interesting map. You see, oh, no, no, okay, next next one. All right, are they, are they pattern six, six, Saida, six, previous one, yeah. Now, you see, uh, 
the darker the color the greater the intensity and frequency of disasters now as you can see disasters occur everywhere in the world they occur in um, uh, america they occur in uh, south america they occur in africa they occur in asia everywhere but then if you look at the uh, damage caused by disasters the maximum amount of damage no idika to saida there is a map with two maps in a page idika next mm -hmm. uh, that one that one yeah now you see you see uh, the darker the color the greater the uh, damage now you see that disasters occur like for top map you see everywhere disasters have occurred in fact usa lo the color is very dark and so is it is in india and in china but if you look at the impact the usa there is practically no impact at all whereas in south america in africa and in india and in china the uh, impact is maximum which only shows that though i mean not that china is underdeveloped but countries which are less prepared for disasters and usually poorer countries because latin america africa and uh, uh, this uh, south asia are usually the poorest uh, countries in the world so the, it shows that poverty and backwardness are closely related, related to the ability to uh, contain the impact of disasters okay so the basically what it says is unpreparedness for predictable disasters like cyclones come every year floods come every year in the indo gangetic plain godavari delta krishna delta to suffer on account of disasters which will which are known to occur is a very poor sign of a country's preparedness and its priorities because all of us spend money on so many things from tourism to higher education but it only shows that not enough money is being spent on this not enough focus is being uh, um, concentrated on this aspect next one 7 to 12 um the uh, next 7 7 am in there ha okay so what we should do is reduce uh, risks and then invest in early warning systems and establish more predictable mechanisms to support recovery next this is natural catastrophes worldwide you know for year after year as you can see both the frequency as well as the intensity are increasing which is unfortunate next but as you can see after no previous term, after 2006 in india there is a certain amount of fall that is probably because of a greater awareness no in the whole world greater awareness of the fact that disaster management is an important subject next one now this is um, worldwide a study uh, by commissioned by world bank and done by maple croft a company it shows that Japan, USA, Taiwan, China, and India are high-risk countries. And then in India, when two of many countries, two percent of the GDP per year is lost on uh, disasters. Now, just imagine you know, for a country which yesterday's budget says we want to grow at eight point six percent. If two percent of that goes away in uh, in disasters, what is the point? So we should pay greater attention to disaster management. Next one. this is also a world wide thing not very important next one so asia alone will have to invest that much of money until 2030 and no nowhere near that amount is being spent currently that is the sad part next one yeah this i have already told you next now yeah so 2% is already i have told you and high risk also next one yeah now you see how preparedness affects like for instance earthquakes 6.7 let us take you know earthquake is measured in richter scale uh, its intensity so 6.7 earthquake occurred in 1994 in usa 60 people died but 6.7 occurred in iran in 2003 and 40000 people died it only shows how an underdeveloped country suffers much greater damage on account of disasters compared to developed countries which are investing much more on that subject and which can afford to invest also because ultimately we know no point in blaming a country because it may not be have the kind of resources to invest on disaster management compared to other basic requirements like food shelter clothing and all that so next one <clears throat> yeah 
India earthquake, uh, no, they're divided into five zones. Uh, zone five is the most uh, vulnerable one. And that is about 10.9, but that's mostly in Himachal and things like that in the hilly areas of the North India. Next one. Ah, now you take the case of Andhra Pradesh government. This is a slide which I showed to the then chief minister. I came here as member and showed him when he was chief minister. Uh, Rosaya was the chief minister. I proved to him that that year one cyclone storm had occurred called Laila. And also in 2009, uh, Mehbub Nagar and Karnul districts were hit by floods from Tungabhadra and the Handri River. Now, the, on account of those two disasters, the loss was 12,000 crores. And now in that year, the state GDP was expected to grow uh, by 5% over 2.65 um, lakh crores. And that 5% comes exactly to this 12,000 crores. In other words, the entire growth and development of a state, of Andhra Pradesh state at that time, was neutralized by these uh, two disasters, which is how unfortunate you can see. All that energy, from money and uh, resources, uh, you know, and also the good that ha could have occurred because of the um, infrastructure was completely wiped out. Next one. So this is hazard profile. You see varying many, we have floods, we have um, this earthquakes, we have um, uh, droughts, then we have uh, cyclones. Once we had a tsunami also. And then we also have landslides and avalanches in the hilly areas. And avalanches occur only in the snow boundary. And then, like every other country, we are at risk to nuclear, biological, and chemical disasters, in, in addition to terrorism, which are, of course, man made disasters. Next one. Now, finally, when the uh, until 2001, Disaster management was with the Agriculture Ministry. Then 2002, it was transferred to Ministry of Home Affairs because they felt that a department of the government of India, which has control over armed forces, um, well, at least um, paramilitary forces, the CRP, the um, Border Security Force, the Central Industrial Security Force, the ITBP, Indo Tibetan Border Security Force, etc., is better suited for uh, extracting response from central government departments and states than agriculture ministry whose you know, authority was usually being ignored. So then finally, after the tsunami in 2004, the, every time a disaster occurred, it's like alarm. I'm sure you also have a you know, system. Hello, please switch off your microphone. Switch off your microphones. Okay, then every time the alarm rang, central government and states were simply putting it on snooze that it's wake, I'll wake up 10 minutes later. Finally, the tsunami woke up everyone and then the act, this disaster management act was passed in 2005 and then NDMA was constituted in 2005, which is when I joined it in October 2005. Okay, then next one. Yeah, next one. So basically what the act did was to bring about a change in approach, a paradigm shift from until then, you see disaster has a cut, disasters have what is called a continuum. First is, if possible, you prevent a disaster. You know, earthquakes cannot be prevented. Floods, say for instance, if uh, Krishna barrage, its uh, height is raised, then the fl flood risk to downstream areas will be less. Then, similarly, we can control, um, we cannot control cyclones, but landslides, so to some extent, we can control by strengthening the hillsides and then uh, building revetments uh, along the roadsides and things like that. So, if possible, you prevent a disaster. If you cannot prevent it, you at least try to minimize the damage by preparing. So, P and P, prevention and preparedness, are two things before a disaster occurs. And after that, well, if it ha happens, you got to provide relief, then you must rehabilitate the people concerned, and then finally, you must help them to recover the losses they made, like in terms of livelihoods and the property lost and things like that. So, until the Disaster Management Act came into force, the accent in the country and worldwide was, I mean, so until similar things happened there also, until the 1980s or so, let us say, in the world, the accent was mostly on only post-event 
uh, response that is relief rehab we were very good at that in india also but prevention and preparedness were being neglected so acts this is together it's also called mitigation how to reduce the impact of disasters the so the, it was backed by a policy then national state and district level authorities were created then financial arrangements were built into the act itself because not then what's the point in giving authority to institutions without money so that was also put in the act so it was a major change called a paradigm shift next so for instance vizag which is an example of how preparedness helps you because until then cyclones were predicted for a long stretch of the coastline say from calcutta to chennai and with just one day um, notice but by the time hudhud happened cyclones it has became possible to predict cyclones with as much time as a week a whole week in advance predictions came and then it came for a short uh, um, length of um, area like visakhapatnam time uh, term uh, town alone therefore if you have one week to prepare for one city you can do all sorts of things you can stop traffic you can shut off power you can stop boat traffic and all that you can store uh, essential commodities you can evacuate people to safe area all this was done therefore the uh, damage on account of hudhud in visakhapatnam was very very little next see unfortunately what happens is disaster management even for politicians and civil servants is not very attractive tomorrow when you join the is also you will be a collector of a district let us say for 3 years you would like to do education you would like to do health or tourism or higher education you know or um, industry or agriculture but if you diesel to nagarjun sagar and increase its capacity who will give you any credit if you jump into a well and rescue a baby your photo will come in the papers and they will probably you will get a medal but if that flood which caused that uh, you know um, well to be get to filled up is prevented by building a dam upstream who will know what the value of that uh, dam is to this particular village so there is no glamour in uh, disaster management which is unfortunate that is why uh, that's why an act had to be brought in to force the hands of the center and the states next ha huh. also techno legal regimes are very very important now for instance in vijayawada earthquakes are very rare but you must be prepared so you must have regulation which say on krishna rivers bank for instance soil will be loose and there is a danger of flooding and when earthquakes happens loose soils are more vulnerable so you should not build anything within a certain distance of the banks of the river krishna uh, which are likely to have heavy construction or house many people so you can have a park but you should not have a theater you should not have a hotel like that so this is what is called a flood plain zoning regulation similarly building regulations you should not build very high rise buildings in a earthquake prone area like say delhi because it's they are at greater risk than ordinary buildings so these are what are called you know building regulations also these regulations are called you know a techno legal regime also techno there is a technical aspect also what sort of cement should be used what sort of steel should be used in a earthquake prone area and then uh, what sort of uh, you know um, distance should be maintained from those parts of the city which are low lying and prone to floods and all that so that sort of thing is called a techno legal regime but unfortunately ours is a country where a draft flood plain zoning regulation prepared by government of india in 1975 and circulated to all state governments because floods is a state subject till today only mizoram and rajasthan have enacted that law can you imagine not even andhra pradesh not even telangana and no no not even bihar or assam or up or west bengal which are very very flood prone it only shows the little importance that is attached to disaster management by the states okay next so paradigm shift already i told you all this okay next prime minister himself is the chairman of the um, ndma so that you know all departments will respond to the um, uh, sort of decisions taken by the authority 
and then the, these are all things which are routine stuff you know next there is an executive committee and what the ndma can do is all there in the act itself you can read it sometime if you are interested next then which ministry deals with which uh, disaster is given here it's also um, very uh, routine stuff it's a matter of this thing this presentation is available you can always look it up next same next next oh. chief minister at the state level and district collector at the district level are heads and the chairman zilla parishad is also a co chairman so that people's representation is also ensured the decision making by that body and then all of them make plans state uh, national level state level and district level next there is also a national disaster management uh, response force mandated by the act in addition to an institute of disaster management which is for training and uh, capacity building and all that and funds as i told you have been created both at the national and state as well as district levels mitigation for and response both so that compulsorily resources required for disaster management are provided for next uh, there is also a national you see um um crisis management committee headed by the cabinet secretary which is meant for you know man made things as i told as i told you bomb blast hijacking ndma does not deal with them but they have to be dealt with and there is a mechanism for that next then apart from guidelines on individual disasters like floods hikes cyclones etc ndma also handles themes like say medical preparedness which is for all disasters similarly psychosocial support like after the tsunami came fishermen got psychologically disturbed and then uh, some of them refused to go to sea so they had to be brought back with say with uh, counseling so such things have to be done and information technology minimum standards of relief clothing food etc medicines and then a response system because often when a disaster takes place it is necessary already for the everyone concerned to know who is the leader who, who is the next one after him who does what who will stay where who will take instruction from whom and people also should know all this whom to go to for help and all that so that is an incident response system all these guidelines are available next so these are details about how these funds are next 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 yeah there is a national policy on disaster management and this is the vision of that policy safe disaster resilient india holistic proactive okay multi disaster and technology driven these are important words for a culture of prevention mitigation preparedness and efficient response uh, continue next okay next thing The, the objectives of the policy, which is roughly what I have been telling you. Next, same thing. Next, ah, this is something about the whole world. In two thousand fifteen, hundred and eighty-six countries, which India has once uh, ratified what is called Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, with seven global targets to be accomplished under four priorities, and it is a sort of a uh, development agenda that provides a once in a generation opportunity to implement development that is both resilient and sustainable until then as i said the development and uh, disaster management were in silos separate now they have been brought together next next saida hello saida Saida Hello Sir 
ఏమైందండి ఓకే ఓకే హలో ఫోర్ ప్రయారిటీస్ ఆర్ అండర్స్టాండింగ్ రిస్క్ స్ట్రెంగ్నింగ్ రిస్క్ గవర్నెన్స్ అండ్ దెన్ ఇన్వెస్టింగ్ ఇన్ రిస్క్ రిడక్షన్ అండ్ ఇంక్రీజింగ్ ప్రిపేర్డ్నెస్ బిల్డ్ బ్యాక్ బెటర్ ఆల్సో సపోజ్ ఎ విలేజ్ హ్యాస్ బీన్ వాష్ ద వే ఇన్ ఫ్లడ్స్ యూ గో దేర్ యూ వాంట్ టు బిల్డ్ బ్యాక్ ద విలేజ్ originally there was no school or hospital you put that back also don't merely replace what was lost but improve the situation over what it was before the disaster happened next this is prime minister releasing the national disaster management plan i told you about next one this is the sendai framework this is the details are not important for you next one this on climate change is also related to disaster management next one next one all these we can go through whenever you want okay these are the 17 um, um, parameters on which they want to transform the world next one next one sustainable development goals were in, uh, announced by the united nations covering all aspects of human life and then one of them is uh, the 11th one is about disaster management next one the 13th one is about climate change is also related next then these are all the guidelines issued by ndma next one i told you already about them thematic as well as disaster wise next then these were being are being finalized yet not completed yet but they will be soon be released next then also how to make this message of disaster management go through in the whole country so it was it has now been mandated that all educational institutions whether undergraduate technical or uh, uh, arts science whatever will uh, have a component of disaster management as and the ministry of education at the national level is ensuring that slowly this is process is um, in fact i have just now uh, sub, uh, sent to the uh, andhra pradesh state council of higher education a draft revised syllabus for the course of disaster management wherever it is being uh, taught in uh, andhra pradesh state and then uh, also with states telling them please for god sake have building bylaws and then do vulnerability and as assessment and risk analysis only i think kerala and gujarat have done so far and then uh, have that flood planning zoning regulation uh, enacted this is advocacy you no know, canvassing with the state governments next similarly in the uh, ias officers training ips officers training and in the training that goes on in the mchrd institute at bapatla in andhra pradesh in hyderabad in the hrd in mcr richard institute everywhere uh, an effort is being made to ensure that disaster management is built into the curriculum and syllabus next this is an important slide i like take a careful look at it you see uh, the mother document for the whole disaster management thing is the act then from that has come the policy the policy then is talks about mainstreaming disaster management into governments then then the guidelines from the guidelines come plans from the plans come measures as i told you uh, a cyclone shelter is a structural measure a building bylaw or flood plain zoning regulation is a non structural measure and for all these things funds are provided by the niti aayog now and originally by the planning commission and also by the finance commission with the result that in the 13th finance commission when i was there we had 200 crores allotted for fire uh, services improvement you'll be surprised to know that on a scale of 1 to 10 india is at some 9 it will get 5 marks out of 100 in the uh, level of fire services whereas singapore will get 100% so fire services are the first responders therefore they were the first to get some assistance uh, under this new regime next
Yeah, state disaster management, this already I've told you. Next one. Some play, states have made plans already uh, in accordance with the guidelines. Some others have, you know, different things have been done in different states. Some states have brought in experts as members of the state disaster management authority. Some people, some states have, as I told you, Rajasthan and Manipur, floodplain zoning. Then some states, Orissa and Kerala, have a policy of their own, which is very good. And as I told you, Himachal, Orissa, and Gujarat have done a hazard risk and vulnerability assessment, which is very good. So slowly it is picking up in the country, but not fast enough. Next. See, different states, again, the same thing. The, the Bihar has a risk reduction roadmap. Then some states have a mitigation fund. Then uh, this national school safety program is under implementation in some states. And then Nagaland has raised its own state disaster response force, which is a very, very good development. So different states have done different things in accordance with their own perception of the priorities and availability of resources. Next. That NIDM, which I told you, is basically tra tra training of officials and non-officials and other stakeholders. Next. Response force, which is a very, very important thing. You see, it comprises people drawn from the four paramilitary forces. The army was the only one available originally. But the trouble with the army was not, well, it, it has more, more important thing to do of defending the country. Its job is not this. And also, they are not trained for this particularly. They are a trained force. They are disciplined. They are organized. But they are not, say, floods, uh, nuclear disasters, <clears throat> or earthquakes. Specialized training and equipment are not there with them. And that is one change which came with NDRF. <clears throat> Another important change that came is that earlier, a state had to have a disaster, decide that it are not able to handle it, <clears throat> then ask government of India for help and then it would come. By the time help came, certain um, areas became inaccessible, no way of reaching them. And also communications have broken down. So the, the damage has already happened. In NDRF, after NDRF has come into being, they are already in place in some different parts of the country. You will see it soon. So they, can, they need not be moved specially. And they are trained for the disasters which will happen in that area of the country. Like in say Andhra Pradesh, in uh, you have one near Mangalgiri, they are trained in floods and um, cyclones. So, and then they know the language, they know the state, they participate in drills and rehearsals. All these advantages have come with NDRF, which were not there earlier. Next one. See how many places it's already there, uh, NDRF battalions, including Andhra Pradesh in Guntur already. Next one. These are places where it is likely to come up soon. Next. This is all the things that NDRF can do, which I told you. Floods, mountain rescue, and then um, medical response, then collapse structure, the search and rescue, like in earthquakes, and then chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear emergencies also they are trained in. Next. So these are Various achievements of the NDR, especially in Cyclone Hood Hood in 2014, they did excellent work. And then uh, their work has been recognized by all states and they have um, saved thousands of lives repeatedly and then saved a property worth uh, hundreds of crores of rupees. Next. It also, um, you see, um, went to Japan and Nepal on request and did excellent work. Next. These are some projects of the NDMA, not very, very important. You can go through them whenever you like. Quickly, Saida, please. Just. Ah, mock drills. This is what I was telling you. Uh, 500 exercises have been conducted all over the country. There, what you do is you imagine that a disaster has occurred. And everyone from the community to the armed forces, to civilians, to uh, doctors, to engineers, etc., participate in it, NGOs and others who are likely to be needed when the disaster occurs. So when it happens, something happens, they have already gone through the whole thing and they don't know exactly what to do. This is the important thing. Next. This is something which I am working on to prepare an index of disasters so that from year after year, 
you can, you know, like blood pressure, temperature, and pulse of a human being. You measure them year after year and see whether there is improvement or not. And with reference here, benchmark. So this is a project prepared by me is, uh, with the government of India, and very soon something may happen. Next. Ah. In Dr. Manmohan, next one. See, when we had no index of that nature, the Prime Minister at that time, Dr. Manmohan Singh, asked us to tell him how well is India prepared. So first we tried to define what is the meaning of preparedness. So we prepared 12 parameters and their weightages. So one, one is very important, capacity building at 12 marks. One is less important, technology at 4 marks. Total 100. Next one. Then we awarded marks to the situation in the country at that time. At that time it was 47% but what the country got. Earlier it was 29% when the NCD, um, NDMA was constituted. Then we said, if you continue at this rate, you'll go up to 72% in two more years, five years more. Five years is over, but we are nowhere near that 70%. But then, meanwhile, the disaster preparedness index idea has come. That will give us a more scientific and rough picture. This was just experienced people putting their wisdom together. What, I, what we called a um, synthesis of gut feelings. Next. These are the things which you know, need to be focused upon in the future. Uh, risk assessment guidelines, because today it's all very um, mechanical, you know, um, subjective and then uh, unscientific. And then financial provision of disaster management plans, then uh, insurance, which is not there at all. Then a disaster database, which is badly required, etc. Next. This is what an Indian team, Japan never asked for assistance, but they asked first in 2011 after the, you must have heard, the unprecedented tsunami and the, therefore the nuclear leak, what happened, when our team went there, show it, please. Next. 46 people went there, led by one Alok Avasti. Next. They were self-contained, they saying here they are. Uh, on the spot in Japan. Next. See, the Japanese people look at these parameters, calm, dignity, and then they, you see, because they are used to tsunamis and earthquakes, the architecture of the buildings, and then the grace, you know, caring for old people and children, and then the order, no looting, no overtaking, by, uh, no anxiety and all that. Next. Then, See, 50 people stayed back in that uh, nuclear uh, leakage uh, power uh, plant uh, voluntarily because somebody had to stay back to run the plant. The power was required, but it was uh, there was a risk of exposure. But that such is their culture. Nobody had to force them to stay. And then, you see, restaurants and others cut prices because they knew that um, supply was uh, a critical element. In India, normally, or in other countries, uh, that is the time when people hold the commodities and make money. And then, as I told you, people, uh, old people and children were shown uh, consideration. And then the press, instead of concentrating uh, on failures of the government and demoralizing the staff, they showed only good things and then uh, very, very mature and wise handling. And then things like, you know, when a power went off in a store, people just put things back and waited for it to come back. Instead of taking advantage and running away with whatever they could lay their hands upon. This shows the culture of the Japanese people, which is ultimately the most powerful anti-disaster mechanism in our country. Next. So this already we've discussed. These are some photographs. Next. This is some loss of life and property after the Hudud cyclone, not of importance to you now. Next. Same thing. So key learnings, so these are the same thing as I already watched it. Now, to conclude, I just want to tell you that uh, Napoleon said that the nation suffers not because of uh, the violence of bad people, but because of the inaction of good people. So our leaders, our civil servants should learn to give proper uh, you know, importance to disaster management. And then everyone must have a role to play in this. In fact, one famous quote by Franklin D. Roosevelt, American president, he said, uh, 
do whatever come you can from wherever you are and with whatever you have that should be the approach and then there is no such thing as overdoing disaster management then one should be able to give it enough uh, priority and finally documentation is also a very important thing and we should learn from uh, other countries so that le learning from experience to improve performance in the future becomes a habit with us and then important thing is one must realize that a time will soon come like in chennai some time ago when you had the floods it all happened because the man in charge of releasing water from a reservoir which caused the floods had to go to the chief minister for permission and for telling the people who will be are likely to be affected and the other side the person who was likely to be affected had to go to the chief minister again to um, uh, take approval for what is to be done in the meanwhile all the damage was done one of these days somebody will file a court a case in court and saying stop governments from spending on anything education or except education health no tourism no culture no foreign travel no sports etc until life and property are safe that is a fundamental duty of the government so before that happens our people should wake up and then importantly last thing this is something i keep telling all my classes and the students mr rajnikanth rao who resides used to reside in vijayawada passed away a few years ago at the ripe old age of 103 he he was a writer he was a playwright he was an actor he was a singer he was a composer he was everything he was a poet he wrote a lovely poem in which one stanza says omkara parivrutam vishwam that the universe is circumscribed by the sound of energy the energy of omkara omkara is sound sound is as you know uh, same as electromagnetism or electric this uh, heat or light so all its energy so there is energy around at the edge of the universe which is what they discovered in switzerland you must have heard of words god's particle and higgs boson and gravitational waves and all that so science and uh, rajnikanth rao's poetry are saying the same thing the universe is expanding at the edges of the expanding universe there is there are ripples in what is called space time and the description is omkara parivrutam vishwam sankalpa parimitam drushyam that if you shut your eyes what is your duty will automatically come to your mind and you will see the big picture which is that first do disaster management save people and property then think of other things thank you very much any doubts i'll be happy to take sir yama sir the funding from the central government is given to the states like before the disaster or like before and after the disaster sir for both preparedness and mitigation or yeah yeah there are there is a mitigation fund at the state level there is a mitigation fund at the central level also okay sir contributions to that fund are compulsory and so a percentage of the expenditure of under plan for each department is prescribed for being spent on disaster management no today we don't have to depend on anybody for anything except that when extraordinary things happen when a national disaster takes place then the central government comes into the picture not otherwise okay so but there are some loopholes that's the reason uh, some states are lagging behind in the implementation of that is true that is true priorities priorities politics inefficiency lack of vision these are there that is why we are all you know doing all this telling you so that tomorrow when you become important people you will know what priorities should be right students any other doubts please ha huh? any other questions saida yes sir students please ask if you have any doubts no sir, think, no sir okay see you then bye thank you thank you sir Uh, students economic class will start within 2 3 minutes please join okay uh, we will start with after 5 minutes okay